believe in God for a lost loved one to be saved, to overturn an addiction or to break a generational curse, perhaps for financial breakthrough, or for intimacy and closer to God's presence, well, the secret weapon to this and so many other things is fasting. Now, I know the moment I said fasting, you went, hold up. But let me tell you, God says very clearly, when you fast and pray, as a New Testament believer, fasting is not an option. It's part of our mandate as our Christian walk. But a lot of people don't understand fasting. It's not dieting. It's not just abstaining from food. It's abstaining from food with the purpose of consecrated prayer. It's a reverence time to God. It's a time that you draw close to God and through intimacy. I just prophesy to you right now that you're entering into a new season and a new beginning. And with the ushering in of every new beginning, there's an ending to something. Some spirits cannot go but by prayer and fasting. Some things cannot biblically by definition leave your life but by prayer and fasting. They go together. First off, what is fasting? It's not dieting. Simply stated, biblical fasting is refraining from food for spiritual purposes. And with that refraining from food, it's where you consecrate yourself to God. It's like if you were going to eat lunch on your lunch hour, you're going to pray instead. If you were going to do dinner at the dinner time, you're going to take that time and worship God. It's a time where you are coming into an intimate place. The Hebrew word is T-S-O-M, and it refers to the practice of self-denial. It's really a crucifying or killing of your flesh. The Greek word has many references, but it means afflicting one's soul or body. So no one's in here going, hey, man, great, I want to afflict my soul and body. I want, to, I want to crucify my flesh. But the results of fasting are so powerful and so profound. From the beginning, fasting was a normal part of relationship with God. I say this often, fasting does not move God. It moves you closer to God. Here's what happens in life. You are a spiritual being and you're having this human experience. Your humanity is in this body with a soul, which means you have mind, will, and emotions. And that stuff can filter in to get to your spirit. So you have to, what I call, clear the clutter, clear the channels. You have to have frequency. You really need an open heaven. And to get an open heaven to clearly hear, to see, to be close to God, to have intimacy, you have to do spiritual practices. One of those spiritual practices is fasting with prayer. There are demonic personalities uh, behind the issue that you're dealing with behind the person that's fighting you. There is a spiritual influence. And so what begins to happen when you fast, it's like it begins to break those spiritual and demonic strongholds and the things that are holding back what God has for you. Remember when Daniel went on the 21 day fast? Well, the first day the prayer was heard. So God hears his prayer immediately. But Daniel doesn't know that his prayer is heard. He doesn't get an answer because there is a principality, the prince of Persia, that's holding the answer up. So there's this demonic, and the principality is the strongest demonic spirit that is literally because it, it affects regions and nations. And Daniel was called to the region and the nation is holding up the answer of God. So Daniel continues to fast until the angel of the Lord is released to deal with that principality. When that principality is dealt with by the angel of the Lord, the answer comes to Daniel. So there are some things that you're not going to get answers for. You're not going to get clarity to. You're not going to have clear channels, frequency. You're not going to get deliverance from your healing uh, until you go on a fast. It's just the biblical way of doing it. This is God's instruction manual, not Pastor Paula's not a preacher's, it's God. So as expressed in Psalm 42, David pleads, and he shows us that fasting brings you into a much more deeper, intimate relationship with the Lord. When you eliminate food, your spirit becomes uncluttered and you get tuned into the things of God because you're praying, you're worshiping, you're clearing it out. It's like it's a spring cleaning. So Jesus continually teaches kingdom principles. And in Matthew 6, the Beatitudes, which I refer to as the Constitution and many theologians do, he provides a pattern for us to live by. Now, these are not suggestions. This should be the lifestyle. These are the Beatitudes. He's laying out the New Testament believers constitution, your way of life, the laws of God, uh, the pattern that you live by. He addressed three specific duties as a Christian. When you pray, when you fast, and when you give. 
So he doesn't say if you pray, if you fast, or if you give. He says when. Now he doesn't tell us how often we're to fast. He doesn't tell us how often we're to pray. He doesn't tell us how much we're to give. But he says when you do these things, because the Holy Spirit will tell you how often. He'll lead you on the fast. He'll lead you how long to fast. He'll tell you how much to pray. You know because you'll feel the burden for prayer. You'll feel when it lifts and you've prayed through, so to say, speak. So he made it very clear that fasting was just as important as giving and praying. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 2 says, A threefold cord is not easily broken. Jesus goes on to reveal in Matthew 6 with these three things, that nothing will be impossible. Now, are you ready? And can you imagine what life will be like when there's no thing impossible, nothing impossible? But to get there, I have to go down God's pathway. Prayer, fasting, and giving. Mark chapter 4 talks about 30, 60, and 100 fold. Have you ever wondered why you're not seeing that complete breakthrough? Why am I not getting a hundredfold? You're giving, you're praying, but have you added fasting to it? Have you broken the back of the enemy? So I believe that when you pray, you fast, and you give, then we begin to see that breakthrough and that hundredfold return. Matthew 6 also says that God openly rewards you. That God will openly, I believe that people are going to see the transformation because you're made an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. So get ready for open reward. Have expectation in your spirit. Start speaking it. There are four basic types of fast in the Word. And it's very important. I want to get these tools to you so you can be in the presence of God, have that intimate relationship. And that was one of the things Jesus, the disciples came and said, why do John's disciples have to fast, but Jesus' disciples don't have to fast? And Jesus basically said, as long as the bridegroom is with the bride, then there's no need to, but as soon as the bridegroom is taken away, then they'll fast also. So when you feel far from God or you don't feel that intimacy or don't feel that closeness that you once felt, you begin to fast because it brings that intimacy back. It brings the bridegroom and the bride together. There are four types of fast. A normal fast, and that's going without food for a definite period in which liquids only, that means water, that's a normal fast. An absolute fast. Now, an absolute fast, I don't recommend at all unless you have a, a very, your body cannot do it for more than three days. That's no water, no food. Moses did it uh, for 40 days. Jesus did it for 40 days. Um, there were people in the Bible that did it, but not without absolute instruction from God and supernatural. Unless you're standing before a burning bush, you don't do an absolute fast for 40 days. You do do a normal fast, water only. This is often what my sons and daughters do when we come together for prayer and we're fasting and we're calling and you'll see me on Facebook, you'll see me on social media calling out for fasting and prayer. We will deny food and drink water only. You can put a little bit of lemon in that water, but it's really just water only. Then there's a partial fast. This you often hear like is Daniel's fast and it omits certain foods on a schedule that includes limited eating. So many consist of eating one meal a day or eating only vegetables. Elijah did this at least two times. Daniel did it. John the Baptist did it. Then there's a rational fast. That's eating or omitting certain families of food for designated periods. That's like grains every fourth day. Now here's the benefits and blessings to fasting. Number one, according to Isaiah 58, it looses the bands of wickedness. There are demonic spirits that have even Christians, listen, you might not be possessed, but you're oppressed, bound. It looses the binding of wickedness and it frees ourselves and others from the addictions and the slavery to sins. A significant reason to fast is to be released from strongholds, sins. Um, I've told you a lot of my struggles before. 28 years ago when I got saved, I suffered with bulimia, I suffered with depression, I suffered with um, abuse, victim mentality. Much of that was delivered from my life on fast. I've been on several 21 days fast. God would give me instruction because of the things of my past. I couldn't get over certain cycles were broken that would be triggered. I'd notice the cycles, what would trigger them like every six months. It wasn't until I started fasting and God gave me instruction because I could hear with clarity, receive revelation. I obeyed what God said and that thing was broken. 
Any sin that cannot be broken with ordinary willpower is called a besetting sin. Besetting sins are not common sins of neglect or rebellion. But God says, thou shall not, and the person says, I will. Now, these are sins that are usually passed down from your forefathers. They run in your bloodline. They're what we call generational curses. They're things that, like it or not, are just passed down that you are going to have to deal with. But God did not leave you in a, in a place that... You're helpless and you're hopeless. A besetting sin is a habitual sinful behavior or attitude that enslaves or victimizes people. It makes you a slave and takes away your will. You love God, but you're trapped. Cry out, I can't help myself. It could be a sexual addiction. It could be overeating. It could be drinking. It could be drugs, overspending, shopping, um, depression, suicidal tendencies, uh, certain cycles, they're, they're besetting sins. And the apostles tried su- unsuccessfully to deal with such a sin by a demonized boy. Jesus taught them in Matthew chapter 17, verse 21, this kind goeth out not but by prayer and by fasting. In other words, there was a demonic personality that kept this boy in a stronghold that he would throw himself in fire. Now, that's not normal behavior. It's not normal. You've got to, there are people right now listening and you cut yourself. And I know if you went to a normal psychologist or counselors, they're going to, there's never been a cutter that I've dealt with or had counseling with or anything that there's not usually been abuse or anything else. But you've got to realize behind just the psychological, behind the emotional, behind the things of the past, there's a demonic spirit that drives things. If you are ready to be free from besetting sins, then you have to know the power of fasting. I'm going to come back and teach you the rest. Jesus taught in Matthew 17, 21, This kind goeth not out but by prayer and by fasting. Besetting sins. There was a young demonized boy who kept throwing himself into fires. It's not normal behavior. And, and he can't get set free. And the disciples tried to cast the devil out unsuccessfully. And Jesus said, there's some things that people will not be free from except by prayer and fasting. Now watch what it means because go without means that you have to fast repeatedly until you get a breakthrough. You have to continually fast so that those things have no room in your life. Jesus taught, yes, it takes faith, but complete deliverance from this type of stronghold is by faith and by fasting. While fasting, there's six necessary steps. Number one, you have to renounce meaning recognizing and renouncing any control over your mind that is not from Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.3 You've got to recognize this, this is not something that is sent by God. It is not for me to be in depression. It is not for me to have self-mutilation. It is not for me to be a victim. It is not for me to live in grief and regret. It is not for me to live in poverty. You have to renounce, recognize, and say, this is not by God. Name it for what it is. You've got to identify, this is a key thing. You see, the moment you begin to identify a spirit, the moment you begin, you have a position of authority over it. So you have to renounce it. Then you have to acknowledge it. Discerning truth from that which is deceptive and acknowledging our own efforts to deceive ourselves. So liberation from spiritual bondage begins inwardly. Psalm chapter 51, 6. The psalmist cries out, You desire truth in the inward parts, and the hidden part of you you'll make known to me wisdom. So God says, what I want is a truthful prayer. And sometimes we don't even know. We can't locate truth within ourselves. Ask the Holy Spirit. Say, show me. Show me where I'm missing it. Show me why I'm frustrated. Show me why I just go into rage like that. Show me why there's anger. There are things that I've discovered that in the natural, for instance, I did things in my early days when I'm 18, 20, 21, 23, and and you have lifelong struggles and proclivities that you continually are being sanctified and working out in your life. But there were certain patterns in my life. And I didn't know till many years later that those same things happened to my mother. They happened to my grandmother. It was this generational curse. So it wasn't until I had a conversation with my mom that I was able to even identify, 
hey, this is, this is passed down. But before I had that conversation, it wasn't random. I asked the Holy Spirit to show me. And God actually took me back even recently to something that was many generations back that had to be broken. They're a very powerhouse person that in the spirit, I just call them a bull. We came in the power of agreement. I said, anything in my past, anything that would drive my future in a direction that is contrary to the purpose, the will, the plan of God, let it be revealed in Jesus name. So you have to acknowledge it. We deceive ourselves when we hear the word of God and fail to apply it. According to James 1 22, don't be a hearer only deceiving yourself. So if you hear the word, watch the word says there's power of life and death in the power of the tongue. Well, you hear that, but you don't apply the truth and you just run your mouth, speak against yourself. Like Job said, I spoke against myself in the weariness of my soul. Speak against a situation and expect somehow God to magically override what you are doing, which is really disobedience. You've got to hear the word and apply the word. If we say we have no sin, 1 John 1, 8, then we're all liars. If we think ourselves to be something, Galatians 6, 3, um, we're deceiving ourselves. When we think we can sin and escape the consequences, of first, uh, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 9, we have deceived ourselves. Because to every action, there's a reaction. Now, your heart can be right with God, but I I look at David. Like, I think David was personally a very miserable man in the natural. I think he fulfilled kingdom. I think he had it going on with God. I think he was a choice servant, but I think he had a lousy relationship with his children. He had failed marriages. Um, He never got the love he longed from from a father. Then he goes after this madman. He has his brother, Jonathan. I mean, it just... His personal life was pretty much just a wreck. He had it right with God, but personally, there was a lot missing. And this is what part of fasting is, is that God wants you right with him, but he wants you right with others. He wants you right with yourself. He wants those patterns and cycles broken over your life, and he's given you the secret weapon. You have to get honest with God and yourself. Number three, you have to forgive. Forgiving others to overcome bitterness and gain freedom. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10 and 11. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive you. And what I've forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I've forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan may not outwit us. Renounce, acknowledge, and forgive. These are the first three steps. And why is that so important? Because without releasing forgiveness then you'll never be able to receive what God has for you. I'm reminded of my mama, Dodie, Dodie Osteen. She's she's my spiritual mother. And Miss Dodie tells the story often how when she got cancer, they said she wasn't going to live, that she was going to die. And there was no hope. They basically sent her home. And and her and Pastor John made a covenant, and the family did, and they came in agreement. And I said, Mama Dodie, what did you do? And she said, the first thing I did, was I asked the Lord if there was any unforgiveness in my heart. And anyone that came to mind and any anyone that just was there, I wrote them a letter and I asked them to forgive me. I thought, to me, Miss Dodie is like, she's the angel on the earth. I mean, I'm like, she's just, she's an angel. And I'm thinking, wow, that's that's powerful. And maybe it's not about what that person did to you. Release them. Surrender. It's not worth forfeiting your destiny. The fourth thing is you have to submit. Bring your life in order to spiritual authority. I know right now you're like, what? But overcoming rebellion in your life by submitting to authority of God that he's placed over you. Matthew 8, verse 8 and 10. Romans 13, verse 1 through 7 even talks about the government, that all authority is chosen by God. Hebrews 13, 7 talks about your church leaders. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 your parents and your spiritual parents in the Lord. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 4, your husband. 1 Peter 2, verse 13 through 23, your employers. Daniel chapter 9, verse 5 and 9, submitting to God. So submission is a huge part of being in position because it's not about, is that person nice? Is they, are they good? Do they treat me right? Again, divine, accurate order and arrangement of things releases you into the promises of God. Number five, take responsibility. You have to take responsibility for your actions and your full liberty. 1 John 1, 9, Romans 6, 13. And then finally, the sixth step is you have to disown. Disown sinful influences that come from bad associations. Exodus 10, 4 through 5 and Galatians 5, 24. 
So when you begin to fast, it clears the channel, it clears the clutter. Six things that are important as you're fasting. Of course, you're doing this through prayer, doing this through consecration, but you have to acknowledge, you have to disown, you have to take responsibility, you have to forgive, you have to submit to authority, and you have to renounce. In the book, there's, I don't know, 40-something different things that fasting does. Number one, it breaks the spirit of poverty. Job chapter 23, verse 12, after all his losses, he said, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You know that he received a double portion. The Bible said God restored Job's losses and gave him twice as much as he had before, that he blessed the latter days of Job more than the first. Joel chapter 2, verse 14 through 16, the people were in such famine at a time that they couldn't even bring an offering. And God said, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, and call a solemn assembly. Then another reason that we fast um, is it brings revelation. It gives you insight. It brings clear perspective and insight seen from the spirit, not from the natural. Acts chapter 9, verse 9 through 18. The apostle Paul's on the road of Damascus. He's knocked off the beast. He's blinded. You know the story. And he had three days without sight. Neither did he eat or drink, the Bible says. Ananias is a chosen vessel, verse 18. Immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Fasting brings revelation. It gives you power. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, being full of the Holy Spirit, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Verse 2, 40 days tempted by the devil and did eat nothing. In verse 14, he returned in the power of the Spirit. So for 40 days he's fasting. He's led by the Spirit. He's tempted by the enemy. Nobody said this was going to be easy. But he comes back in the power, the dunamis, and his ministry is launched. I I don't know too many ministries that have really been significant in the earth, whether studying historically or present day, that have not been launched by the power of fasting. When God called me, I went on a 21-day fast. I did it several different times, defining moments. I always heard from God. Even when I do Woman Thou Art Loose or a big engagement, Apollo White Crusade, um, the beginning of every year in January, we fast the entire month. There's so many things that fasting does, but the point of it is, as Jesus says, when you fast, if you're ready to break the bonds of wickedness, to break poverty, to have revelation for the power of God, for your ministry to be launched, for choosing church leadership, if you're ready to find your Boaz, your spouse, whatever it is, these things are not going to occur in your life without prayer and fasting. It's God's way of doing things. But if you prepare yourself for his presence, God will never disappoint you.